thank you for who you are. You are majestic. You are powerful, omnipotent. And your authority extends to the ends of the earth, not only to the ends of the earth, but to the end of the galaxy. Every inch is yours. And yet, Lord, you care about what happens here. You care about what happens in Bellflower, California, in this building. Lord, you care about the hearts of your people here. So much so that the, you would loosen the chains, that our chains would fall off and you would set our hearts free. And that we can rise and move forward and follow you. And now, Lord, there is no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the work of Jesus. Thank you for all of that was purchased by his blood. We are now clothed in righteousness. You see us as righteous because the righteous one has given us his and has taken our filthy rags. So Lord, we come to you now. We boldly approach the throne of grace asking for mercy, asking for grace, that you would help us to see you, help us to know you, help us to know the grace that comes from you keeping us and walking with us and seeing that you will complete us until Jesus returns. Thank you, Lord, for that grace. Help us to understand it a little bit more now. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. It's good to be here with you. Thank you, pastors, for allowing me to preach and be with you guys this morning and serve this way. How do you know, question, how do you know you will wake up a Christian tomorrow? How do you know that? What makes you sure that you will not wake up unbelieving or heading down a path that leads to destruction? A few of you asked me, why Jude? Why would you preach this random book at the end right before Revelation? Why? My answer is because I am amazed that I am still a Christian and that God is keeping me this far and will keep me to the end. Many of you know the whirlwind that my family has been going through lately. If you read the emails, some of you don't read your emails. That's okay. I get it. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those sometimes. Um, but this past, past month, for those of you who don't know, um, my little daughter, Jubilee, she had the rotavirus. She got the rotavirus. And it, we didn't know what it was, and you know she was throwing up, diarrhea, fevers. She couldn't, she couldn't, um, like, consciously like stay awake. Like her eyes were rolling in the back of her head, and I, she doesn't even look like the same person. Like a little child, she doesn't look like you can see the, her ribs, and you're just like. She's not supposed to look like that. I'm going to take her in. And so as I'm driving to the ER, I'm looking at her in my rearview mirror, and her eyes are just rolling in the back of her head. And I'm like, Jubes, wake up. Jubes, wake up. And they're just rolling. And I'm like, Lord, don't take my baby. It took four calls for her to actually respond. I didn't know if she was going to make it or not, honestly. And it was not only her. Four out of five of my children got this virus. They were throwing up. There were things coming out of both ends of their body, and it was just chaos. And on top of that, um, I have gout, 
and my foot is hurting and my elbow is, I can't hold the babies very long. And so I was just, I was having a hard time helping out. And my wife was a superstar, a rock star throughout this whole thing, taking care of all the kids and me during this whole chaos. But in my mind, I'm thinking, God, are you good? I don't see your goodness right now, God. I don't see your goodness. There's so many things that, are, that can happen to us. Not just me. I know there's a lot of things. There's a lot of emails that are going out where people need help. And there are a lot of things that go on to cause us to question the goodness of God. Now I'm asking you, what causes you to doubt God's goodness? Miscarriage? Divorce? Unable to have children? Not having the child you wanted, like special needs child? Dysfunctional marriage? Loneliness? Depression, terrible work life, physical ailments, financial problems. These can all be situational, but it doesn't have to be. What Jude is dealing with here is not just situational, but also the allure of the world. False teaching. It's incredibly, incredibly enticing to our sinful hearts. The health and wealth prosperity gospel. If you believe hard enough, you can become rich. Or you believe hard enough, you will be healthy. Or on the flip side, if you don't believe enough, or if you're not healing, you are not believing hard enough. That sounds crazy to us at a church like this, right? Like, psh, prosperity gospel, are you crazy? That's not going to happen at BBC. We're not going to talk about that. But it can creep up on us very subtly. I want to make this much money so that I can be comfortable. Maybe the, the goal is not riches, but it's comfort. And not more of God or not gaining more so that you can give more, but just so your life can be comfortable. The world is very good at enticing us. It's very... Um, the world, the philosophies, the commercials, media tells us that we need enough or we don't have enough and we need more things. Or it could be the self-help type of thing where you are good enough. Be you. Do you. You're fine just the way you are. It sounds great. It makes us feel really nice, warm and fuzzy inside. But the reality is you are not fine just the way that you are. You need a savior. You need Jesus. You don't have everything you need inside of you unless the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And even then, when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, he's pushing you to be like someone else, not yourself. Same old you. But these things are easy to believe. And Jude is dealing with the same stuff. False teachers in the church with their deceitful doctrines. Jude is writing this because... There are people who are making a shipwreck, who are making shipwreck of their souls following these false teachers. He wants people, in verse 3, contend for your faith. Contend for your faith. And people were changing, or in our text here it says, they were turning God's grace into sensuality and flat out denying Jesus. In verse 4. Look, at me, look with me at verse 4. Jude 4. Some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. All right, they snuck in. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus, our only master and Lord. Okay, so they were sneaking in and giving false doctrine like Shall I continue in sin so that grace may abound? Paul says, no, by no means. 
But that's the, that's the mentality of what's happening here. God will forgive me anyways, right? I can indulge in sin. I can indulge in pornography. I can indulge in all of these sensual acts because I'm going to be forgiven anyway, right? They find themselves with a license to prostitute God's grace rather than prize it. They were, there were professing Christians, but they were not actual Christians. They may have experienced the grace of God at one point in their life, but they were not eternally saved by that grace. And we can see that in verse 5. If you look at verse 5, it says, Now I want to remind you, although you came to know all these things once and for all, that Jesus saved a people out of Egypt and later destroyed those who did not believe. They were saved for a little bit, saved. They, they knew enough to get by, but then were destroyed in the end. And this is relevant to us. This is very relevant to us today. People are turning from the church. Don't let it be you. And this is relevant. Let me explain one, um, how I got saved. I was five years old, just about a week, a little over a week, um, before I turned six. Um, we were running around, me, PJ, um, and two other guys. We thought we were the Ninja Turtles. Um, there was no real, you know, we weren't real ninjas or anything like that. We, we just jumped down a, a flight of stairs and we thought we were Ninja Turtles. That was it. But I'm going to use the Ninja Turtle names that we thought we were so that I um, protect identity here. <laughs> um, so we're running around, the pastor, we're running around in the, pa um, in the back of the service, right? And he just stops his sermon. Stop running around, you four Ninja Turtles, go to my office, wait for something there. Wait, just wait back there. And we're like, oh shoot, everybody's looking at us. All right, so we just started walking back there. And we walk back there, and he tells his daughter, who's sitting in the front row, just get up and tell them anything. Teach them something, right? And so she comes back there, and she teaches us the gospel. And she explains the gospel to us. Okay? And we grew up in the church, PJ, or I'm sorry, Leonardo, um, <laughs> being the oldest and the leader of our pack. He always knew all the answers to the Bible questions faster than everybody else. He always got to the, whenever we had Bible contests, he would always win. Um, so let's just, you know, let's move on from him. Um, the other guy, the four of us, Raphael, um, he didn't show much interest in Christ. He heard the gospel and it seemed to have bounced off of him. Okay, he was he was one like he he was there and he hung out with us, but for the sake of like it seemed like it bounced off of him for the sake of girls or fighting and other things. He was kind of the rebellious one of the four of us. The seed of the gospel kind of seemed like it just fell onto the side of the road and the birds were swift to snatch it up. Um, and then there was another guy. Donatello, okay? Donatello was my best friend for 17 years. 17 years. He was also competing against Leonardo for all the Bible contests. If anybody was going to compete with Leonardo, it was this guy. He was smart. He was a leader in the youth group. He taught the word. He led the congregation in song very well. He went to Bible school. And then you have me, the fourth of the Ninja Turtles. I was Michelangelo, the best one. <laughs> and I was Raphael's partner in crime. So if he got in trouble, it was usually me right next to him. And I got in trouble as well. But I was always around. Okay, I didn't really care about, you know, being the best Bible guy or anything like that. You know, being at the Bible studies were fun and that was good enough for me. I care more about being funny and hanging out and having a great experience, good time. I would go to church. I was also a leader in, in the youth group. 
but it was just because I was like, it was by default, I was just around. They're like, here, you've been here for a while, why don't you do something? <laughs> so they, they let me do stuff. Um, but I was the wild card. I could have went either way in everybody's eyes. Out of the four of us today, there are two following the Lord Jesus Christ. The other two may be heading for hell. We all heard the gospel at the same time. We all heard the same message, delivered the same way. How can it have such different effects? Donatello, my best friend for 17 years, is now transgender. He believes he's a woman. He denies that Jesus is the only way to God. He calls our Heavenly Father, Heavenly Mother. What happened to Donatello? What happened? You're one of the best of us. Why, God, why me? Why am I not falling by the wayside of Christianity out in the world making shipwreck of my life, of my soul? For you, how do you know that you will not fall away from God? Christian, believer, how do you know you will wake up tomorrow a Christian? Answer, now to him who is able to keep you. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Point number one, God keeps us. I have three points. God keeps us is point number one. Okay, and many of you have noticed that this is a doxology and we sang it a few times or a couple times. Thank you, Aaron and wife, beautiful wife. Thank you. It was a doxology. So let me explain the formula of a doxology. Okay. Let me explain it. It's usually two parts of a doxology. First, it mentions what God has done or what God will do. And then secondly, it acknowledges the attributes that it took or characteristics that it took to accomplish those actions. Okay? So the first, it's what God has done or will do. And then secondly, it's the attributes that it took to complete those actions. So here's an example. To him who adopts rebellious, abandoned children who were once enemies. Okay, that's the action. He adopts us. To him belong mercy, boundless compassion, glory, and infinite grace. That's the characteristics or attributes that it takes in order to complete this action. That's how doxologies work. Okay? So... In, in my example, we ascribe to the Lord and celebrate his compassion and grace because that's what it takes to adopt abandoned children. Let's read our passage again. Verse 24. Now to him who is able to protect you, to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. Action. Okay, characteristics to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now, and forever. That's the characteristic that it takes to do the first thing. Now, Jude is celebrating two actions here. God is keeping us from stumbling and makes us stand in the presence of his glory without blemish, with uncontainable happiness, with joy. And what attributes of God were expressed to make these things happen? God's glory, majesty, power, and authority. Brothers and sisters, do you hear that? What it takes to keep you from stumbling is God's glory and majesty and power and authority. All the way until the day of the Lord. The reason why I am still a Christian, the reason why you are still a Christian 
okay, is not because I was in the right place at the right time, because Donatello was right there, right next to me. It's not because my parents were Christ-cherishing believers that was there all the time, because his parents were right there with him. It's because God is glorious and majestic and powerful and authoritative to keep me. That's why at the end of the day, when you are depressed or you feel the weight of the guilt of your sin, depressed from failures or life is not going the way that you hoped, wondering how you're going to keep going on or you can look at these false teachings of today and stand firm on God's word rather than crumble under zero tolerance towards Christ. Why? Because God keeps you. God is keeping you. If God did not keep us and hold us together by his glory, majesty, power, and authority, you would not be a Christian. If your salvation your ministry, your faithfulness in marriage to your spouse, your love for the church were left up to you, you would not have them. You would not cherish holiness. You would not wage war against sin, but you would succumb to it like a slave. If it were not for these attributes of God, we just sang it prone to wander. Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. If he does not take your heart and seal it for the courts above, it's gone. Jude is clearly amazed at what it takes to keep you a Christian. What it takes to awaken a soul and sustain a spiritual life and keep it from collapsing under the weight and pressures of this world. Jude is amazed at what it takes to wake you up as a Christian every day and keep you believing. Question for you, how do you measure glory, power, and authority? How do you measure majesty and what it takes to preserve your life? How do you quantify glory? What metric system do you use to measure God's power? I don't know. We can't measure this kind of force that it takes to, uh, that a divine being takes to push and uphold a created being. All that Jude is telling us and that we know and this is what this text is saying is that it takes infinite glory, infinite majesty, infinite power, infinite authority to keep you believing in him. You, you can do it if you can measure infinity. He was majestic before time existed now until the end of time. That's what it says, right? Till now and forevermore. He will never cease to be glorious. He is majestic. He will never cease to, uh, or when, when we talk about his majesty, it speaks to the honor that is due to him. He is positionally and infinitely exalted over all creation. And when we talk about his power, he is infinitely omnipotent. He is all power, rules over every inch of creation. Nothing happens apart from his consent. Complete dominion over everything. And he has the authority to exercise that power whenever and on whomever he chooses. Do you remember Pharaoh? He hardened his heart for his own glory, for his own purposes. It's purposeful sovereignty, meaning everything that he does is for his own purpose and will. Some would call that providence. Jude is saying that that's what it takes to keep you a Christian. God's sovereignty, providence, authority, power, majesty, all of that keeps you 
believing in Jesus. Now, how does he keep us? How does that work? How does he keep you when there seems to be no evidence of faith in the way that you've been living? How does he keep you when your faith is smothered under the weight of sin? When you're discouraged or depressed, things aren't going your way. Two things to point out, point out on how Jude does this. Look at verse 25 of Jude. Verse 25. Okay, the means that God the Father uses is God the Son. God the Son. Jude says it is through Jesus Christ. The means of keeping you is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, so if you're here and you're not a Christian, please listen up here. This is really important. Judgment is coming. We will all come before our creator and give an account for our lives. You, like the rest of us, are a sinner. All of us in this room, sinners. You're blemished. And God doesn't take blemished people into his presence. But he's so angry with sin. He hates sin so much and he considers it an eternal offense. Meaning he will punish it for all of eternity. Look at what's happening here. Okay, look, what are you doing? What is your posture like in this text? Okay, you are standing before a holy God. Okay, he is able to make you stand before the presence of God. Do you understand the audacity to stand before the presence of God? Brothers and sisters, you're able to stand, you are able to stand before God and not crumble in front of the maker. Psalm 130 verse 3 asks the question, Lord, if you keep an account of iniquities, Lord, who can stand? He does keep an account of iniquities. He's not sweeping sin under the rug. He keeps an account. Who is going to be able to stand? The answer, Jesus can stand. And the answer the psalmist gives is those who have been forgiven can stand before God. Forgiveness only comes in Jesus Christ, the one who is without blemish. We stand because Jesus, the one who is able to stand, was crushed for our sin. We stand there without blemish because the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, was substituted for us, the unblemished for the blemished. He doesn't look at my sin, my, my sin-tainted record, but he looks at the flawless life of Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel. That's what we look at. That's, what, that's our hope. As sinners, in the Old Testament, people died when they got too close to the presence of God. Moses had to cover himself, hide himself in the cleft of a rock just to see God, his majesty. God said, Moses, if you see my face, you're going to die. And yet here, Jude actually says in that day, there will be a day that comes where you are standing in the presence of the glorious one. Not hiding your face, but you're standing there with great joy. Why joy? After all the things that you've done in your life, you're standing there with great joy. Why? Having joy in that moment comes from an un unshakable confidence that you will not be condemned because of the finished work of Christ. Your sins have been forgiven in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Paid for, in full, you will not be destroyed. You will experience, you will not experience infinite wrath, but infinite grace. And the second thing that Jude points out on how we are kept, look at verse one of Jude. Verse one of Jude says, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James to those who are called, beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ. Or kept, yeah, kept for Jesus Christ. Okay, those three things. 
We are called, we are loved, and we are kept. Those whom he has called, he has also kept. No one is lost. No one that he has called is left out of God's keeping. Romans 8.30. Please turn there in your Bibles. Romans 8.30. Says, and those he pre those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Okay? If you were predestined, you were called. And if you're called, you're justified. And if you're justified, you will be glorified. No one gets lost. No one falls between the cracks like, oh, man, I didn't make it to justified. No, you will be you will make it to justified and you will make it to glorified. That will happen for us. And Jude is saying the same thing. You are called by God. He will keep you from stumbling until you stand before the presence gloriously without blemish. He is keeping you. Brothers, sisters, he is keeping you. Okay, second point, keep yourselves in the love of God. You keep you, okay? Second point, you keep you. First point, God keeps you. Second point, you keep you. Look at verse 20 of Jude, back to Jude. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. Okay, hold on. Time out. You just spent 30 minutes talking about how God keeps us, and now you're telling me that I keep me? Who's keeping? Who's doing the keeping around here? Am I doing keeping, or is he keeping? The answer is, yeah. Amen. Good. Yeah, you, everybody. We're all keeping. Okay? This is one of the great dichotomies of the Bible. This is also a cause for a lot of misconception and sanctification. People can think, if God is keeping me, I can do whatever I want. He's not going to let anybody snatch me out of his hands, John 10, right? Nobody's going to be able to snatch me out of his hands. But that's similar to what the false teaching was in Jude's time. As we said in verse 4, right? They're perverting the grace of God. The other misconception is, I'm doing all the work. I'm keeping me. I'm doing all the work. God initially saved me, but now my holiness and sanctification is up to me. Both of those extremes are very wrong. The answer is both. God is keeping you and you are keeping you in the love of God. Turn to Philippians 2. With me, please. Philippians 2, verse 12 and 13. Philippians 2, verse 12 says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Who's working there? You. Work it out. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do you see who's doing the working here? You are. Strive hard. Work it out. But who else is working? Verse 13. God is working in you. So that you're working out your salvation is God working in you. It happens simultaneously. That's the same thing as what we're talking about with Jude. Keep yourselves. God is keeping you. And you keep you in the love of God. Those two things go together. Paul understands this in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read it. 
But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Okay? It's by God's grace that I am what I am. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Okay. So God was working, but now you worked harder than any of them. And then he says, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. What? So, it's the grace of God, but you're working harder than everybody, but it's the grace of God. Yeah. Both. God is working and you're working. God is working through you so that you can keep yourselves in the love of God. So, I mean, to be as clear as possible on this, God works, we work. God keeps us, and we keep us. God keeps you by keeping you. God keeps you by you keeping you. And you do it by his power. How do you keep yourselves in the love of God? Jude tells us, if you look at the three participles that are around the main verb, it says, build yourself up in the faith. Build yourself up in the faith. Okay? Learn. Brothers and sisters, learn. Study doctrine. Listen to sermons. Read books that teach you about your faith. Most importantly, get into the word. Read the word. That's the way you build up your faith. You can't build up your faith if you don't know your faith. You cannot be profoundly influenced by that which you do not know. Read the word. Second thing he says, pray in the Holy Spirit. It means praying according to scripture. Pray for God's will and not your own. Pray for things that God is passionate about, like the spread of the gospel to all nations. But it doesn't even have to go that far. Pray for the gospel to be spread in Bellflower. Pray for the gospel to be spread to your neighbors. Pray for the gospel to be spread to your co-workers. Have you found that it's very difficult to keep a regular prayer time? Maybe I'm just by myself here, but it's very, it's very difficult. Okay. But that's a practical application that you can do. Set aside a prayer time for yourself that you can read the word and pray it back to the Lord. Okay? If you don't discipline yourself to read the word, your sinful nature, my sinful nature will always find us something else to be busy with. How many times have you been on Facebook or Instagram or Tiki Tok trying to figure out what's going on? Like you spend all your time doing all that stuff and you're like, where did all my time go? Where did all my time go? That is the devil. That is your sinful nature finding the other things to do than to discipline rather than disciplining yourself to read the word and pray regularly because <laughs> that's how you contend for your faith and the third one he says wait expectantly for mercy wait expectantly for mercy that is to come okay so Jude is fixing our eyes on the future hope here fixing your eyes on something that is coming in the future and the future hope is a powerful motivator for the present action. It's a powerful motivator for the present action. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. He's going to hold us to the end. He's going to keep us to the end. Till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last. Do you long for the day that you will see Christ face to face? That's a powerful motivator to wait, actively wait, and contend for the faith until he comes. Actively long for that day, and we get it turned around a lot of the time. In our shallowness, we try to build 
our lives here thinking that this is it, but it's not. We get it turned around in our shallowness. We would rather remain here. But to the degree that our hearts are set on this earth, our ability to contend for the faith suffers. Our longing for Jesus is lessened when we are attached to the things of this world. So wait expectantly for the day of mercy. It's coming. And my last point, and this is something I've learned a lot about in this church, being a part of this church, BBC, you guys are great at this. So point number one, God keeps us. Point number two, you keep you. Point number three, we keep us. We keep us in the love of God. We do it together. Look at verse 20 to 23. But you, dear friends, as you build yourselves up in the most holy faith, okay, so build yourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. We just talked about those three things. Have mercy on those who waver, save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. We can do a whole nother sermon on this, just these four verses here. We're not going to, I'm not going to point out too many things here. Just a couple things before I close. Jude is speaking to believers here. All of the second person pronouns, those are plural. Okay. Keep yourselves, all of us keep, he's talking to a group of people. We keep us in the love of God. We do it together. It means we keep us in the love of God together. How? Same way I just talked about. By building us up in our most holy faith. Together. We pray in the Holy Spirit. Together. We wait and push each other to wait expectantly for that day. Together. And this is the strength of our church. And just as a personal testimony, Reese and I have felt very loved and very cared for by this church. Whether it was just pouring into our marriage, taking care of help, just meals, loving us very well. Jennifer Lee and the other Care Bears, <laughs> they do a great job of taking care of us. Taking care of people in need. Every time someone reached out to us from the church, it was God keeping us through your kindness and your generosity. God was working through you to keep us. And there was a member of the church that came by my house. I will not mention Chris Valencia by name. I won't do it. Um, but when I received bad news about my health, he prayed over me. And I was so blessed. He prayed that I would rejoice that my name is written in the book of life. And me hearing bad news, I was depressed. I wanted to run away. I wanted to not think about it, which only makes me more and more depressed. But God in his wisdom used this brother to remind me that God is in control and that when it's all said and done, I will rejoice around the throne because of what Christ has done for me. My name is written in there by Christ's blood. And what Chris did, oh, I mean, that member did is he pulled me back. He snatched me away from the fire because my heart and my mind started going in the wrong direction. And when he prayed that over me, he pulled me, snatched me back, kept me from making shipwreck of my soul. And that's what we do in this church. That's what we're supposed to do as a church family is keep each other, shepherd one another. And that's why we encourage in this church Bible reading together, praying with others together, read the Bible together, 
praying with each other, share the gospels, the gospel with others together. You may be used by God to keep a brother or sister make, from making shipwreck of their soul, of their faith. Or as verse 23 says, you may be snatching them from the fire. Let's pray. Father, we praise you because we are very finite. Our power is measurable. Our authority is measurable, but yours is not. Your majesty and your glory and your power and authority keep us believing in you every day. You are able to keep us, not just able, but you want to keep us. You are going to keep us and we can bank on it that you are going to keep us until the day we see Jesus Christ. And now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. So the only God, our savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, authority before all time, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.